بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي اصبحنا واصبح الملك لله والحمد لله رب العالمين وشكرا دنس مرحبا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I want to welcome you to this event, to the Global Islamic Finance Forum 2022. Uh, inshallah, we would like to begin with the recitation of the Holy Quran by one of our young leaders, inshallah, our brother Ismail. So inshallah, please come, Ismail, come and recite uh, Surah Al-Fatiha, inshallah. الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنا فتحنا لك فتحا مبينا ليغفر لك الله ما تقدم من ذنبك وما تأخر وما تأخر ويتم نعمته عليك ويهديك صراطا مستقيما وينصرك الله نصرا عزيزا هو الذي أنزل السكينة في قلوب ليدخل المؤمنين والمؤمنات جنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار خالدين فيها ويكفر عنهم سيئاتهم وكان ذلك عند الله فوزا عظيما صدق الله العظيم آيات that talk about the fetch, the opening we pray that this gathering will be an opening for all of us we pray that it is filled with blessing we, feel, we pray that it is filled with knowledge that is beneficial and you know I want to just uh, with this dua, I want to just mention a once upon a time when I was in Saudi Arabia, I had the great fortune of meeting one of the fathers of Islamic economics, Dr. Omar Chapra at the IDB. And I asked him, you know, what is the purpose of this whole endeavor that we're trying to do, this whole Islamic finance, Islamic economics? And I remember, subhanAllah, I just came in unannounced and he had books piled high on his desk. And he said the purpose of all of this is to make the financial system a rahmah lil'alameen. To make the financial system a form of mercy to everyone and everything. So inshallah, uh, that was the goal of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Inshallah, that's our goal. And we pray that we are able to reach that goal uh, with this. And we have good intentions. And inshallah, we will begin bi hurmat al-fatiha. I want to invite uh, the founding, the founder of Al Mangos, our brother Abdul Muhaymin Mensi, to come and give his uh, opening remarks, inshallah. Jazakallah khair and thank you so much. بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Honorable Esma Tialdrim Guest of Honors Ladies and Gentlemen Brothers and Sisters I'd like to greet all of you with the best greeting Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Before I start I'd like to express our appreciation 
to Mr. Ismat Yildirim, who honored us today with his presence despite his busy schedule because he felt it was important um, to attend. Also, our appreciation to all of you who are involved with us today in any capacity, whether you're sponsoring or enabling this event to take place here today. I'd like to precisely thank the ICD, um, which is based in Saudi Arabia. I'd like to thank Tekebebe for their amazing support and Adfimi for the contribution and uh, the amazing support they have shown since we have um, uh, started the, uh, the concept and shared the concept with them, so thank you. If you have asked me seven years ago whether we will be having such a gathering here in Istanbul, I would never have believed you. My only relation to the city was just a normal tourist um, who fell in love with every corner which is full of history and rich culture. And today we embark on a journey to enrich the financial system also reaped in history through participation finance. This gathering here today is not just an event or a normal gathering, but a beginning of a journey which all of us have a part to play to bring to reality. With this in mind, I strongly encourage all of you to engage in all of the sessions and with each other. We also have some exciting announcements that you will hear over the day, so stay tuned, but most importantly, importantly, please do enjoy yourselves. I don't want to take much time of yours, and I look forward to addressing you again at the conclusion uh, at the end of the day. Thank you very much, and I wish you a very successful day. Assalamu alaikum. Okay. Inshallah, then we want to invest, invite our guest of honor, uh, the mayor of Istanbul, the mayor of Omraniya, which is my hometown now, uh, Mr. Ismat Yadrin, to please uh, take the stage and deliver his uh, keynote address. Barakallahu fikum. Değerli katılımcılar, iş dünyamızın kıymetli mensupları, sizleri saygı ve sevgiyle selamlıyorum. Üçüncüsü düzenlenen İstanbul Fintech sirvesine katılmak üzere ülkemize gelen misafirlerimize de hoş geldiniz, sefalar getirdiniz. Birçok finansal kuruluşun genel merkezine ve yakın zamanda da hayata geçirilecek olan İstanbul finans merkezine ev sahipliği yapan Ümraniye'mizde sizleri de ağırlamaktan mutluluk duyuyoruz. Dünyamız değişmeyen tek şey değişimin kendisidir. Sözünü bir kez daha haklı çıkaran bir sürekten geçmektedir. Geleneksel finans yöntemlerinin yerini dijitale bıraktığı bir döneme e, girmiş bulunmaktayız. Bankacılık sektörü bir süredir İslami finans noktasında da gerek katılım bankacılığı sistemiyle gerekse faizsiz enstrümanlar ile piyasada kendine yer edinmiş durumdadır. Bu alanı genişletmek noktasında atılacak adımlar büyük bir önem arz etmektedir. Türkiye Cumhurbaşkanımız Sayın Recep Tayyip Erdoğan liderliğinde de faize karşı açık bir tavır almıştır. Faizin dünya ekonomisindeki yerini korumasının zenginliğine, zenginlik, fakirliğe de fakirlik kattığı gerçeği efendim gerçeğiyle yüzde bulunmaktayız. Dinimizce de haram kılınan faiz bireysel çapta olduğu gibi küresel çapta da benzer bir sonuç doğurarak büyüme potansiyeli olan ülkeleri egemen ekonomilerin altında ezerek mevcut düzenin devamını tesis etmektedir. Her yeni dönem iyi değerlendirilmesi durumunda yeni ve büyük değişimlere yol açmaktadır. Bu noktadan bakıldığında dijitalleşmenin yeni bir fırsat oluşturduğuna inanıyorum. Dijital para bilimleri, online bankacılık hizmetleri ve fintech adı altında çeşitlendirebileceğimiz birçok alana İslami hassasiyetler çerçevesinde entegre olabilmenin bağımsızlığımız açısından da çok önemli olduğunu düşünenlerden. Dünyadaki faize dayalı mevcut düzenin ayakta kalabilmesindeki en büyük etken alternatif maalesef oluşturulamamaktadır. İnsanlara yeni sistemler sunmakta çok daha kararlı ve etkili olmayız. Her şeyden önce teknolojiyi yakalamalıyız. Geçmiş sorunlara değil, 
gelecekteki ihtiyaçlara da odaklanmalıyız. Dijital değişimi yakalamalı ve kendi alan tanımımızı doğru şekilde yapmalıyız. Bu amaçla katılım bankalarımız tarafından hayata geçirilen uygulamaları ve yazılım altyapılarını yakından takip ediyoruz. Ülkemizdeki mevcut duruma baktığımızda mevduat odaklı bankacılığa kıyasla katılım bankacılığının yüzde beş altı seviyesinde seyrettiğini görüyoruz. Dijitale yapılan yatırımların bu oranla daha yukarı çekeceğine inanıyorum. Çağın ihtiyaçlarına cevap verebilecek daha adil bir ekonomik düzenin hayata geçirilmesinde İslami Fintech zirvesinde sektör mensuplarının istikrarlı bir şekilde üçüncü kez bir araya gelmesi çok önemli bir gelişmedir. Organizasyonunda emeği geçen herkesi ayrı ayrı tebrik eder. Bu noktadaki çalışmalarımızın ve gayretlerinizin hayırla sonuçlanmasını Cenab-ı Hak'tan niyaz eder. Sizleri saygı ve sevgiyle selamlıyorum. Tekrar hoş geldiniz, sefalar getirdiniz. Toplantınız hayırlara vesile olsun inşallah. Had made it easier to access financial services, easier to invest in health, education developing bridge platform, and the FinLet platform, in addition to other digital initiatives, aiming to speed. Dear distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Hoş geldiniz. It is a great pleasure for us to welcome all stakeholders and esteemed participants from all over the world who came here to exchange their experiences at the third Global Islamic Fintech Summit. As the Participation Bank Association of Turkey, we are honored to be on and uh, to be an official partner of this exclusive event. We also have the privilege of holding this prominent conference in the beautiful Istanbul, which plays the role of being hub of regional and global capital flows. The conference, which is the with its deem, uh, Islamic finance in the digital area addresses uh, the future of Islamic finance in general and importance of digitalization of participation banks through fintech collaboration in specific. In the uh, last two years, along with the pandemic, digitalization efforts around the world have gained momentum in the banking and finance sector, as in every sector. The banking sector has taken its place among the sectors where we experience many innovative products and services that bring needs and new generation technologies together. Our participation banks in Turkey are involved in this transformation and have accelerated their investments in digitalization as well. STKBB, together uh, with Ernst & Young, we have prepared a comprehensive digital research report in 2021. With this report, we aim to build one of the key uh, objectives of our participation banking strategy as building digital competences. We will continue to observe the developments in this field and we plan to accelerate our efforts to support the ecosystem, especially related uh, in, to fintechs. In 2022, we expect from both conventional and uh, participation banking sectors in Turkey to initiate establishment of digital banks. The main strategies of the digital banks will be uh, to focus on competitively gaining new customers with a fast and efficient service approach as in the example around the world. It is evident that customer perceptions and preferences will, ch will change with uh, the products and services offered through fast, simple, high quality and transparent processes. Within the expected developments, 
it will be beneficial to increase the number of players in the market to spread participation banking to a broader area and accelerate the sector's growth, especially for the retail and SME customer segments. Before closing, I would like to say that it is essential to keep continuous growth, momentum of uh, participation banking on the path of digitalization. I wish to thank all participants, make this ceremony worthwhile, and special thanks to Mr. Mansi for organizing this prominent event for the sector. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum and good day everyone. Wa It's uh, it's a pleasure to participate in the third Global Islamic FinTech Summit with the distinguished panelists, uh, Mr. Umar Suleiman and Mr. Ahmed Ilyas Çöllü. Uh, our fire set chat is focusing on uh, the vision 2025 of participation finance. And we will be, inshallah, focusing on uh, current outlook, key challenges, and opportunities of participation finance. Uh, let me underline from the outset the term participation finance and uh, encompasses participation banking, participation based capital markets, insurance, and even social finance. Uh, now, the participation finance is on the brink of a significant change. Now, the uh, participation finance strategy document and part new participation finance act covering all of the sectors of participation finance are all on the way. And uh, inshallah, the goal is to make uh, participation finance a systemically important sector within the domestic financial system and also to make Istanbul as a global financial, as a global Islamic financial hub by 2025. Before we get started, uh, I'd like to introduce our distinguished panelists, uh, Mr. Umar Suleyman. Uh, he's the global head of risk uh, at Wahed Invest. Uh, and uh, he started his career as an auditor in uh, Big Four. Also, he sits on the board of uh, UK IFC. Also, he established the National Wakaf Fund uh, in UK. Uh, now, he, he, he works at Wahid Invest. Uh, Mr. Ahmed Ilyas Çölü is the vice president and head of international banking Treasury and Strategy Group at Vakıf Katılım. Uh, he worked uh, as an Islamic banker in Turkey, in Kuwait since the beginning of 2000. Uh, he also took place at the establishment of Vakıf Katılım, and now he heads the International Banking Department. Uh, the plan in this fire set chat uh, is that uh, we will discuss uh, our focus point for about 20 minutes. Then I will allot around five minutes for question and answers. Then, inshallah, we will finish. Inshallah. So, uh, let me start. And, uh, and the questions, the created questions, will be composed of three parts. We will first focus on uh, current outlook. Then we will discuss key challenges, and we will also look into the uh, details of uh, opportunities of participation by uh, finance. So let me get started with uh, Mr. Uh, Umar Suleiman. As an international investor in Islamic finance, how do you see the current outlook of participation finance in Turkey? Okay. Um, I appreciate English may not be everyone's first language, so I'll try and speak a little bit slowly. Um, I see the opportunity within Turkey as huge, mashallah. Turkey has a number of factors in its favor. 
it has a productive capability. It's, it's known for its manufacturing, mashallah, participation, finance, and industry is well integrated, as it should be. Unfortunately, today, Islamic finance often focuses on finance rather than production. And Turkey gives it that fertile opportunity to support real industry, real production, number one. Number two, it has a, alhamdulillah, a young population. The median age, I believe, of Turkey is around 30. 25% of Turkey's population is what we would call millennial and younger. Millennial and younger. So this means we now have a population which is digitally connected to the world. There is no more financial arbitrage. They have the same access to information as the rest of the world. People hopefully, inshallah, are more socially conscious as well. So we have all of these things together that inshallah give Turkey a real opportunity for growth. I think also, alhamdulillah, what you see with Turkey is an established base of professionalism. When you, and I, unfortunately I have to say this, when you look at the rest of the Muslim world, Turkey is the leader, I think, when it comes to professionalism. When we look at our experiences, I used to work conventionally, I used to work for HSBC, and I used to travel, I was head of the Middle East, uh, of which Turkey was part of that. And there was a huge gulf between Turkey in terms of how professional they were. So this also means that people who are investing in Turkey have that confidence that they will be dealt with, inshallah, accordingly. So when you put all of this together, and then also the fact that Turkey sits uniquely as that bridge between East and West, we hope, inshallah, that there'll be a huge opportunity for growth because we have the professionalism of the West, inshallah, the opportunities, the development of the West, but we hope to meet it with the principles of the East, principles of equity, of fairness, of this is what participation finance actually brings. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Umar. Uh, Mr. Ahmed, uh, as coming directly from the sector itself, how do you see the current outlook of participation finance in Turkey now? Especially, what was the progress uh, for the last, uh, over the last five years? Thank you very much. Uh, participation finance does not only mean that uh, uh, participation banks, as you uh, very well underlined. Participation banks uh, consist of uh, Islamic banking, the uh, participation banks, uh, Islamic investment companies, uh, asset management funds, as well as uh, tekaful uh, industry. So, uh, these, these three have different histories in, in Turkey. Now, uh, alhamdulillah, the, all this have come to a level that's supporting each other and taking the overall sector forward. The participation banking has a, a officially a history uh, since the year 85, whereby the Islamic sukuk and fund management uh, started after the 2010-12. Uh, uh, now we have asset management companies. And uh, in the very near future, we will have s segregated and separate tekaful companies. So given these options, people will uh, choose more and more the Islamic option in investment and in tekaful. Uh, for the last five years, the most important achievement was, uh, of course, the moving the market share. Our mayor has said it is five to six, but in fact, it is seven to eight now. When the uh, state-owned Islamic bank started with Zira Katalim and Wakif Katalim in 15 and 16, and followed by Emlak, from where we have also colleagues here. So uh, all these state-owned uh, uh, participation banks have supported the overall industry and moved the sector from four to five uh, to seven to eight percent. So it almost doubled in the last five years. So this means uh, additional uh, more than 300 branches, uh, additional uh, around 20 billion capital in the industry. So this, when you have new entrants, of course, the existing players, they have to adjust them, themselves uh, thanks to the competition. Of course, uh, the foreign uh, Islamic banks or the uh, other Muslim countries owned Islamic uh, participation banks, they have been supporting the, in the overall industry and we hope they will continue and maybe we will see new entrants in the near future because everything is changing. Uh, this is a, a FinTech summit. Now we have a law that you can establish a digital bank. 
So maybe in the near future, uh, we will see Islamic uh, electronic bank uh, in Turkey. So uh, we are doing fine and we will be better. Uh, the outlook is positive, more positive than the overall market and promising. Okay, thank, thank you, you Ahmed Bey. Uh, just I want to add that uh, the current market share of uh, Islamic May, uh, banking is around 7.5% or more or less. It may come a bit uh, low, but please don't forget it was just around 1.5% in the beginning of 2000s. And uh, it was around 5%, but for the last uh, three to four years, it is showing an amazing growth rate. And if this growth rate can be sustainable, then we can see uh, easily, inshallah, uh, the participation banking will be uh, a systemically important segment within the domestic financial system. Now, uh, let's move to the, uh, some key challenges. Uh, we have an outlook uh, on the table, but we have also big challenges. And uh, the participation finance should uh, uh, tackle all of these uh, challenges uh, in a careful way. Uh, so let's uh, get started with uh, Mr. Uh, Umar. Uh, what are the key challenges uh, facing uh, participation finance in Turkey? Yeah, so if I perhaps address the key challenges facing participation finance globally, then we can look at Turkey as part of this. I think it's important to understand. Um, one of them is the general level of financial literacy. So people's understanding of finances generally in the, in the, in the Muslim world is, is lower than I would say uh, the, the, the West, for example. Um, but specifically within that, you layer on now understanding Islamic finance. Uh, people may understand conventional finance, but for them to understand Islamic finance and how really Islamic finance brings adil and justice, people don't understand this and why you may receive less money but over a longer period. All of this needs, people need to understand this and educate this. On a normal everyday transactional level, your comparison is with conventional finance. So if you talk about an interest rate, now you're saying, no, there's no interest rate. Perhaps there's going to be profit, maybe there won't be. True Islamic finance, there may be profit or loss. So now you're educating people, you need to bring them forward with all of this. So this is a global challenge, and I think in Turkey as well, there'll be this challenge of now, let's bring people to understand the different types of products. So if we talk about murabaha or mubaraba, or you, you know, we even talk about taqafal. I'm sure most people won't know the difference between taqafal and falafal, you know? And so we need to understand what's happening, what do these terms mean? But how do we apply them? And also, how do we create a regulatory framework that really enables Islamic finance, participation finance to flourish? The structures aren't the same. The world's regulatory system and taxation system actually benefits debt. It benefits debt. I live in the UK, and you are rewarded for taking debt. You're rewarded for taking debt. Now, this isn't a system that's sustainable. This isn't something that is good. Long-term damage comes from this. Added to this, we're also living in a time of hyper-materialism. Everybody wants everything now, but they don't want to pay for it. Now, this is a genuine phenomena. I spoke about Turkey having a young population, mashallah, but this has its challenges as well. I tell you, in the UK, you can see now the rise of buy now, pay later. So even buying something simple like your shoes, instead of paying for it now, you want to spread the cost and you bring interest into it. So now you have to say to people, actually wait, have a little sabr, have some patience in the way you interact with each other. This is better for the economy, this is better long term. So educating people on this is going to be a challenge. So when you mix all of these, I think these are some of the challenges we have around financial education, especially with Islamic finance, participation finance, creating the regulatory framework so those who come with true equity participation are not punished for trying to be involved in the system. And three, the general phenomena of consumerism. Consumerism. You see, the challenge is when times are good, everybody enjoys it. 
But as soon as some challenge comes, the people won't be able to handle it. And this is why Islam in its wisdom and the Sharia, when it talks about finance, it's always about adil, it's always about justice. Whether it be for the investors, whether it be for the people who are actually doing the enterprise, whether it be for society. And so all of this needs to change and there needs to be a reassessment. And why I said globally there's a challenge with the Islamic finance industry, Islamic finance, as it started maybe 30 years ago, addressed a specific problem. We're now looking at age of disruption, even in Islamic finance, where now it's not good enough. We want to see more truly Islamic Sharia-based products coming through for us to flourish. And this is Islamic finance, participation finance, version 2.0, which I hope, inshallah, Turkey will lead the charge in bringing about. Inshallah, inshallah. Now I want to specifically focus on participation banking. Uh, Mr. Ahmed, uh, how do you see the key challenges facing, faced by the participation banks? And can these challenges uh, could be an impediment in reaching out uh, the 2025 goals? Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, it looks very optimistic to move the market share from 7.5% uh, to 15% within a couple of years. However, I believe that this is achievable how. Uh, as we mentioned, the, the joining uh, of the new entrants, the state-owned Islamic banks, helped the uh, move market share double in five to six years. Uh, but there is an acceleration. Uh, why uh, this acceleration is to do with uh, technology and digitalization. When we started the bank, it was a challenge for us to reach out to people. Now, uh, by the beginning of this year, even uh, without coming to our branch, and this is possible for every bank, you can open uh, an account with us and move your fu uh, funds from a conventional bank to our bank. It is possible. We know that when people are given this option, they tend to choose the Islamic uh, one. Uh, there is a very good example. One of the most uh, important structural reforms uh, in Turkey in the last decade was this uh, private pension funds. And there was automated participation. And uh, all the uh, employees were asked, uh, almost 70%, uh, 68% said, yes, if there is an Islamic option, I go for Islamic option or interest-free uh, at a similar uh, return. So when people are given this option, they choose the Islamic. And we will see this in tekafil industry. We are now seeing this in uh, pension funds and investment funds. We are seeing the performance of the uh, Islamic funds overall. Uh, so, uh, in term, uh, it was a challenge uh, to reach out to people. Capital was one of the challenges. Now, the state-owned banks are supported by the, uh, the government in terms of capital, and the private uh, Islamic banks, they can raise tier one and tier two uh, to support their growth. So, the capital, we cannot say it's the, uh, the challenge now. Uh, in terms of regulatory framework, there has been improvements in the last two decades, and it is ongoing. Uh, uh, even uh, your role is very important here. So uh, currently the challenges is to make available alternative products uh, and reaching out to people. Uh, so we have to also fight the, the understanding that there is no difference in these two from both ways. Uh, people with uh, more sensitivity in this regard have to know that there is the difference uh, and they should choose, of course, at a similar and competitive uh, price or, uh, you know, a, a, at least it, it, there shouldn't be a big gap in terms of availability and cost. So uh, <coughs> the, another challenge is human capital, of course. When you establish an Islamic bank and uh, you, you are growing fast and organic and opening new branches, qualified people is a challenge for the, uh, you know, the uh, for Zirat Katalim, Wakif, and Emlak, because there are a limited number of uh, existing Islamic banks, and they are, they are growing themselves, and they are opening also few branches every year. So it's a challenge, but we have uh, now uh, academies and universities uh, educating people. For, the, for our future, we are uh, training our own, uh, uh, you know, we are hiring fresh graduates and training them, but uh, you need to quickly uh, open branches. 
physical presence uh, was a challenge, but now it is becoming less and less relevant. The younger generations uh, use online banking. Uh, people below a certain age, they don't even uh, go to a branch. They do everything online, from opening the, uh, initially the account, opening the investment account, uh, applying for a loan and everything, for funding. So uh, physical presence is becoming less and less important, but uh, Islamic banks are opening more branches than the conventional. So I mean, there is an acceleration with the digitalization and uh, other players of the sector, uh, investment companies, fund management, and Tekafil, this will all support. Uh, doubling uh, has taken place in five years, now it can take place in three years, uh, inshallah. Inshallah. Thank you, uh, Ahmed Bey, for your comments. Uh, just uh, let me add that uh, human capital is quite important, and we have, a, as the finance office of the uh, presidency of Turkey, uh, we had an ambitious plan of uh, giving training to 10,000 young talents to prepare them for the participation <coughs> finance. Uh, we uh, already finished our first batch of uh, training uh, in, if I am not wrong, on November. Now, this week, inshallah, we will have our award ceremony. Uh, then, uh, finally, let's move to our uh, last part of uh, discussing uh, on opportunities. Uh, we already talked about current uh, outlook, uh, key challenges, and let's see to the future. Yes. Uh, let's look at more correctly to the future. How do you see, especially I want to focus on Istanbul Finance Center project. And uh, as you might know, participation finance is one of the two pillars of that project. Uh, so Turkey wants to make uh, Istanbul as an international Islamic finance hub over the forthcoming years, inshallah. Uh, so how do you see this opportunity? Yani, what do you think about the Istanbul Finance uh, Center project, uh, participation finance within that uh, project uh, idea as an international investor? So I see it as, uh, I think it's amazing, mashallah, that you first of all have this project in place and this project that will grow. The Istanbul Finance Center becomes a place of focus. So when you think of, for example, Silicon Valley, you think of technology and development and so on. Istanbul Finance Center, inshallah, should become that hub for Islamic finance because it's, it's, it's a period of growth, it's a period of technolog technological connectivity and it's new. And what I really liked was this discussion about ecosystem. Islamic finance is wider than Islamic banking. So you have the banking, you have the takaful, the kind of insurance, but you also have financing. And part of the financing is supporting entrepreneurs. Having a place where entrepreneurs can come to, where they can look to each other for development and support, this is amazing, mashallah. I don't think we should underplay this. I've seen in the last few years a number of people, people I know from around the world who have moved to Istanbul specifically because they want to be based here as entrepreneurs. So this is also very welcoming, that actually it becomes a place that you bring in talent, that you draw in talent. And now that talent, if they're all located centrally, they can benefit from each other. This mutual benefit is very important, but also in a, in a friendly way, competition. Once you're there, it increases you. This is Ihsan, is that you compete with each other for good. Having just one digital bank isn't good for, for example, for, for Turkey. You want a number of players so that you increase and you have better products. Better products, better service, better quality of people coming through. Now, all of this is a journey. And you have to have somewhere where actually that begins that journey. And so Istanbul Finance Center, if I was thinking about investing from as, as an external person, I think, okay, alhamdulillah, this shows intent. This shows commitment. The fact that you want to educate 10,000 students, mashallah, this shows long-term thinking. This isn't just someone who's trying to take advantage or capitalize a sentiment. This is people who have thought about the long-term need for, uh, for participation finance and the sustainability. You're going to have more products. And this, we're living in a time where the, the, the pace of change 
is much quicker than before. So what before would take 10 years or 15 years of change, we now, now have in a very compressed time. So you need to have human talent that is able to meet these needs. And that will happen by learning from each other. So having a center, alhamdulillah, definitely, I think, meets that requirement. So I think we've shown the commitment, the long-term planning, and now the opportunity, if we're at 7.5%, that means there's 92.5%, inshallah, that can move. And you can show customers. 100%. Look, it, there's no compromise on profit. This is a misunderstanding that they say that if you go for participation finance, that you have to compromise on return. No. Actually, it's shown long term, in terms of growth and return, it's there. Now it's people to have that faith, inshallah, and the responsibility on all of us, everyone here, to take that responsibility to help deliver this. You know, on one side is the growth, on the other side, if I may just say this point, there will never be any blessing for any economy or any country that is, is mired in riba, in interest. I have to say this. There will be no barakah, no growth. Allah says this, not me. That there will be no growth. It's the opposite. So when you try to bring a system that is sacred, that is divine, that has the principles that Allah wants us to adopt, it will only mean blessings in this world and the next, inshallah. Inshallah. Uh, just let me make a small uh, addition to your comment uh, with regards to talent, uh, uh, yani, uh, attracting talents uh, with the propulsive power of Istanbul Finance Center. I know at least three people here, Brother uh, Mutaj, Brother Ashraf, uh, Brother Mansi, who believed in the you know, potential of uh, Istanbul and move to here. Uh, just wanted to uh, share with you. Uh, uh, Ahmed Bey, uh, how does the participation banking see the uh, Istanbul Finance Center project? Is it a boon for the further growth of the participation banking over the forthcoming years? And do you think it is a viable project? Uh, uh, the Istanbul Finance Center is uh, as a national initiative is very important uh, for the country, but we have uh, quite some competitive advantage when it comes to Islamic uh, financial center rather than conventional. In the conventional, your competitors are of course nationally uh, London, Zurich uh, and uh, elsewhere. But you cannot talk about globally. We cannot say this, is, this city is the financial center. Uh, inshallah, Istanbul can be. Inshallah. We have, of course, more competitive, as brother uh, also uh, discussed and argued, we have competitive advantage to become uh, more specifically the Islamic financial center than any conventional, uh, as uh, in terms of location, in terms of regulation, and in terms of practice and attracting from both West and uh, East. Hopefully, uh, it we, this will mean uh, strengthening Islamic uh, b existing banks and uh, maybe more entrants. Now everything is changing and becoming very quick, uh, as also Omar mentioned. Now, uh, for example, it was taking maybe a very long time, three to five years, to establish, and it is still ongoing in some countries, to establish a digital bank. Maybe it will be possible to open a digital bank in six months or less. Mm. in the near future. So uh, international investors also will like to uh, come here and open uh, Islamic banks, probably. Uh, although they are digital, of course, they will have a presence and they will serve in, uh, they, they will have a, an initial market. So I believe uh, it will be beneficial for the existing players, Islamic banks and the takaful industry and uh, fund managers Inshallah, it will be very uh, good for us. It, uh, it will help our uh, target of doubling the market share in a short uh, period of time, Inshallah. Thank you, Ahmed Bey. Uh, it seems we have exceeded our allotted time. Oh. So let's, let me just briefly summarize my main key takeaways from this fireside chat. Uh, when we talk about current outlook, key challenges, opportunities, we yani, uh, always come up with the same keywords: human development, yani more, more correctly, human capital, uh, 
a regulatory uh, framework, enabling more correctly regulatory framework, uh, educating people, and it is also uh, directly relevant to perceptions. And these are maybe the main, yani the main uh, keywords that uh, any uh, policy making process should focus on. Uh, uh, I wanted to take some questions, but it seems uh, we have exited our time. There are other panels, there are other people. So let me uh, stop here. Uh, please, uh, so, sorry for this, but uh, we have to use time uh, effectively. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Can I just say one point? Sure, sure, sure. Seconds. I just want to say this, look. For, for Turkey to support participation finance, especially when it comes to foreign investors, one of the huge things when you think from a national discussion is that when you think of financing normally, they come in to take economic surplus and productivity out of the country. It's very much an old approach. When you have participation finance, it's coming to share in the growth. This is a huge mindset difference. So it's, and inshallah, if you have that quality of investors coming in, it's because they want to see Turkey flourish and they also benefit. Versus coming in, taking any good out for themselves and leaving Turkey potentially in a worse state. This is a huge difference. So when you're supporting participation finance, inshallah, the quality of investors who are in this journey with you will be better. Inshallah. Inshallah. Thank you. Thank you. Sure, sure. Yes. Yeah. I think first of all you have to have quality of delivery of product. So the Islamic products have to be delivered exactly in the same digitally. But the big thing is education. Education, education. I just want to ask the people here, okay, and I assume people here, maybe there's different levels of practicing. But if I said to a person who's a Muslim, would you want to like to eat some pork? What's your response? Never. If I give you some alcohol, I say, take a drink, what would you say? Never. But if I say to you, here, take this product which is full of riba, that Allah and his Rasul are at war with you, harb min Allah wa rasulihi, why do we accept it? There is no sin in which Allah and his messenger are at war with you. Yet we, we're okay with it. If I gave you this food, we'd say no, we'd push the plate away. So we have to educate people, again, that this isn't a choice of, of Islamic and uh, you know, conventional. It's haram and halal. This, this, this isn't a choice. And we have to educate the people, but we have to make sure our product is just as good, if not better. And then everyone will accept it. I think generally, alhamdulillah, people all want to be better. And so if they're given an option that's competitive and easy, then alhamdulillah, they'll, uh, they'll adopt it. And we'll see the, the, the background, inshallah, the change it makes long term to our society. Thank you very much. Just a small comment. Maybe most people really don't know. Yani, uh, giving, taking, intermediating, yeah. even taking record of riba is a very, very big sin. Yeah. Uh, maybe we should uh, remind them all, all the time. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you very much for your contribution. I really, uh, a big thanks to uh, the organizers of this event. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the insistence on asking some questions. But uh, in Hamabi, I am eating from your time. Please, uh, okay, okay, please. Uh, please shortly introduce yourself and uh, shortly, please, we'd like to take your question. that are creating different blockchain technologies with the amazing training presidential offices giving, uh, giving a strong uh, actually appreciation for that. Uh, the entrepreneurship 
in fintech is growing and this is why we're here today, today together. Should we relook to our terminology? Because if we say just Islamic finance versus conventional, in a way we're approving and we're saying, oh, that's the main way, conventional is the main way, and we are kind of alternative. My proposal is we should use halal finance because the other way is not, it's not a way. That's just a suggestion. I'm very uh, interested to learn your opinion. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Thank you. I also take this as a question. Uh, I think this is the last one, inshallah. And okay. Who, who wants to? Let's take the other questions if you like. To I, think we, we are... I, I will take your question, inshallah. Uh, I, I didn't forget you. Uh, yeah, uh, naming the, the bank uh, banks and their products is a little bit a sensitive matter in the different countries. In, in, not in every country you can call an Islamic bank an Islamic bank, but halal looks more, more, <laughs> more friendly than Islamic. In, for example, I'll be very open. In Saudi Arabia, for other reasons, you cannot call an Islamic bank Islamic bank. Yeah. In Turkey, you had uh, different sensitivities. But uh, in terms of the product itself or the service, uh, it looks attractive to me. Uh, it makes sense to, to say this is halal banking. But there is discussion, uh, there is a lot of ongoing discussions internally, uh, improving the general awareness, even of our, even our own people, and even the people who have general uh, religious sensitivities is important uh, to make them believe that, yes, this is a, an alternative, and this is different. So halal finance, to me, it looks okay. <laughs> Thank you, Ahmed Bey. Please. Salam Tala, well, uh, Dr. Sami from uh, Finiopolis Consulting. Thank you for you uh, for the uh, very interesting talk that you have uh, just uh, done. Um, my question is, um, maybe I was, uh, you know, asleep or something, but uh, I haven't heard um, about the Islamic fintech within the vision of, you know, uh, participation bank in uh, 2025. So can you just maybe elaborate on that? Okay. Thank you. Whom uh, are you directing your question? <laughs> I don't think it's me. me. I'm afraid to me. <laughs> Let me just say something about fintech, and then it may help you address this as well. Look, fintech isn't a, it, it, it shouldn't be seen as a separate industry. Fintech is just delivering financial products better through technology. Okay? Sometimes we overcomplicate it, and we say fintech is something really different. No, subhanAllah, it's using technology to enable you to deliver whatever you want to do in a better way so if fundamentally the products are not good then technology means that you get rubbish products to more people so if the products are good and we should always look at this the fundamentals never change whether it's islamic whether it's halal finance whether it's conventional whether it's fi uh, fintech the base has to be something which is going to be beneficial if you create value then there will be a market for your product, okay? And digital, digital is just digital delivery. So fintech, I don't think needs to be necessarily a separate area that you look at. What we want to encourage and support is innovation, innovation and entrepreneurship, of which now technology is an enabler. Technology is an enabler for that. So inshallah, I think if you create value, then everything else will come behind it, inshallah. Yeah. In fact, yeah, we didn't use the word fintech uh, in our session, but we mentioned technology and digitalization, etc. Of course, fintech is something else and more than that. Uh, it will be discussed in the other uh, panels. Uh, this opening panel was uh, to introduce the overall uh, Islamic banking scope in the country, is a participation finance, as we call it here, katılım finance in Turkish. So. Uh, we have mentioned uh, where is uh, participation finance coming from, where, is it, where it is heading, and uh, in, in the sense of open banking and APIs, etc., it will be discussed in more details in the coming sessions, I believe. It requires a general uh, re uh, regulatory adjustments uh, where we are heading towards, and in our life, uh, uh, including the Islamic banks in Turkey, uh, we are in, into fintechs and APIs and open banking and integration, etc. Yeah, All this is happening yeah, yeah. at the same time. But we are not, this panel is focusing on the overall Islamic finance and the, the vision 
of uh, at least 15 percent market share. Thank you very much. Inshallah, I think um, with that, yeah. let's end this yeah, panel. Inshallah. This is, mashallah, everybody's very excited about participation banking in Turkey and doubling and doubling, inshallah, bless it, bi'ithnillah. Thank you so much, our distinguished panelists. We're going to take a quick... Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. <coughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm very, uh, I'm very happy to see all participants here. And also, uh, I warmly welcome all participants on behalf of ATFIMI, one of the sponsors or organizer of this seminar, and uh, on behalf of the Art Participation Bank and on behalf of uh, all organiza organizers. Uh, thank you very much, all participants, for their very important investing time for jo joining us uh, on this seminar. And uh, I'm very grateful for uh, all participants, uh, grateful uh, speakers, ladies, gentlemen, and children. Uh, and also, it's very important and it's very uh, enjoyable for me to see some of the children in this uh, seminar. It's very good. Thank you, all participants. And also, today, uh, we will talk, we will discuss about gold. Uh, firstly, uh, the importance of the gold, it is uh, very important, as you all know very well. But uh, today, today it's becoming more and more important on the international uh, global area and financial area. As you know very well that uh, Alton is uh, one of the most important uh, payment models before, uh, before the financial system. And now, today, uh, it is uh, it's again uh, understood, very well understood again that Alton is one of the most important payment system, especially in, uh, especially in international trade, international organizations and payment system. And so, as you know that uh, gold is also uh, one of the important uh, share compliance uh, method in the Islamic world. Uh, yeah, lots of participants here, I see that uh, from the Islamic board and Islamic participation and Islamic banks. And uh, it is also important where you uh, share our complaint principles according to the Islamic rules and uh, Islamic uh, banking principles. Uh, taking into consideration for that uh, in this seminar, uh, it will be very helpful for us. And today, uh, we will discuss the uh, Gold as an uh, as a uh, alternative transfer payment system, especially in international area, international trade. And we have two uh, very important panelists. And Mr. Metin Özemir, uh, he's the general manager, uh, board member of the Zero Participation uh, Bank, and he's one of the most important uh, economists of the Turkey, especially, especially in the banking and finance area. And uh, also, he is the chairman of the ADFIMI, and Mr. Said Özgel from the Takas Bank, and he is uh, one of the very most important economists of the Turkey. And both of the two panels are very, very important uh, experience in their own area. And today, uh, let me to, inter uh, to start with Mr. Özdemir about, uh, uh, about the gold payment system historically background of the uh, gold uh, throughout the years and financial system and uh, today's position and uh, what will be next in the future. Uh, also, thank you very much uh, for your kind attention. Yes, Mr. Uh, Özdemir, the ground is yours. Thank you, Mr. Brother Ilham Öztürk. Dear esteemed guests, distinguished speakers, and panelists, I warmly welcome all of you on behalf of both the Rath Participation Bank and at FIMI, and thank all participants in this seminar. Very briefly, please allow me to introduce you at FIMI, the Association of National Development Finance Institutions in member countries of the Islamic Development Bank has been operating as an international organization since 1987 with the headquarters in Istanbul. Basically, ATFIMI organizes training seminars and meetings for senior executives of financial institutions operating
for development purposes and currently has 39 members in 17 countries. Today in this panel, we will discuss the gold as an alternative payments model in the global financial system. Good, the gold mining has been very important throughout the human history. It's also the first well-known financial exchange currency of human history. It is estimated that around 80% of the total gold reserves has been mined. Therefore, there is very little left unmined. But today, sometimes gold mining is being criticized by some circles due to its environmental impact and con concern. But lots of scientists are working to reduce these environmental effects of gold mining as most of the countries were uh, obliged to meet the terms of Paris Agreement by 2040-2050 to reduce their loss of fossil and to switch to renewable energy for gold mining. The another point to note is that gold is also not only valuable but also recyclable, meaning that it will not be an environmental pollutant. Therefore, when it comes to environmental impact of the gold, definitely it can be minimized. The standard gold system was being used since 1870 until big depression as global financial system. All of the currencies were converted to gold, but after the World War I, all the countries started to print their own money without taking into consideration of its provision or equivalent to the gold due to some economic and financial reasons. This caused big depressions, and in USA in 1944, Bretton Woods Agreement was signed by 44 countries that accept US dollar as a reserve money. Nowadays, throughout in its historical period of time, the gold is determined as an investment method. Today, we are not talking about making gold the only currency. We are talking about accepting it as one of the methods of payment. Why? It is possible as an alternative payment model or system, especially for international trade. Today, all the countries and banks still have gold reserves because we know that gold does not have credit risk or counterparty risk, which makes it <coughs> the most important asset to have in the reserves. But if we talk about gold as one of the forms of payment, we would have discussion of scarcity of it. However, that can be said for all forms of payments, including fiat money or currencies. There is a lot of fear on the simply availability of gold because we know it is not infinitive. Nothing is. Even with currencies that can be printed, the problem is how much money you have to print as a country. Demanding an unlimited and unrestricted money printing due to some economic and financial problems means to equal some other fiscal matters. If you print unlimited currency, it causes high inflation that we face today's financial economy. But the gold itself has this characteristic. That is why it is a safe form of investment and payment and a good way to back up the value of fiat money. The current financial system cannot meet the needs in an environment of political and economic uncertainty. It has bottlenecks for underdeveloped and developing countries. Even trade relations between neighboring countries are hindered. Countries 
that are aware of these are in search of new ones, methods such as shopping with regional associations, new payment systems, and national <coughs> currencies are being tried. The gold-based digital currency is one of these methods. I think this will be re realized together with the strong economies of the world, among which the blockchain-based monetary system, which is supported by central bank banks, is integrated. We will follow the presentation of the next speaker with great interest. I would like to thank all the speakers and participants. Thank you very much. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Metin Özdemir, uh, for your uh, uh, brief information about the development, circle development of, of gold uh, in the financial system. Yeah, it was very important for us that uh, to show that the circle development of the uh, gold uh, until the uh, big depression, uh, especially in the United States and the throughout world. And uh, as we understand very well that until that time, all the, uh, all the domestic currencies uh, will be uh, converted to gold. And according to the uh, uh, country's gold system and how much they have in their central banks or etc. On, on their stocks. But after that period, after especially from the great de great, uh, big depression or great depression, uh, there was some, uh, some uh, very bad influence of, uh, of um, global currencies or domestic currencies in the uh, financial area. Uh, if you have, as a country, uh, authority to print unlimited uh, print uh, authority, uh, printing money, uh, it gives you a big and high inflation. That's now today we have, uh, we face uh, throughout the world financial system. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Uh, as Mr. Metinerzim emphasized in his speech, uh, why not we don't use uh, the gold as an alternative payment system uh, in the global area, especially for the international trade, for the international uh, transactions? And, there is uh, some methods and some studying uh, on this. And today we have another uh, speaker and presenter, uh, Mr. Said uh, Özger from the uh, Turkey, Takas Bank. Uh, he's very important, very, uh, very special uh, economist of Turkey. And uh, Takas Bank and a very special project about on that issue, uh, using of the gold as an alternative payment. Uh, in the internet, especially in the banking system. Um, Mr. Said Özgür will talk about, about that system uh, which is named called BIGA project. Biga, yes, and yes. Uh, he will give us some detailed information about that project and using of that project in international area or the inshallah. international payment system, as he said, inshallah, in the next future. And the, uh, the plans about that issue. Yes, yes Mr. Said Özgür, uh, the grant is yours, please. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. First of all, many thanks to Mr. Ilhami and Mr. Metin for inviting me to this El Mangos and uh, brother Abdul Muhaymin's wonderful organization as a speaker. And it's an honor to be here for me. Uh, my name is Said Zekeri Özgel. I am the director of payment and transfer services at Takas Bank, Takas Istanbul. Uh, let me first tell you about Takas Bank's role in money and capital markets and the other services it offers. The major purpose and activity of our bank is to provide clearing, settlement and custody services to the Turkish capital markets. With our central counterparty and banking licenses, Takas Bank mainly provides clearing, settlement and custody, central counterparty and banking services to its members in Turkish capital markets. And Takas Bank, which is a subsidiary of Borsa Istanbul, is authorized to provide cash and security settlement transaction as the central clearing and settlement institution to Borsa Istanbul equities, debt securities, foreign securities, derivatives, and precious metals markets. And Takas Bank is being a bridge between money and capital markets by providing reliable and robust cash transfer services with low costs, 
Takas Bank renders clearing and settlement services within the framework of capital market and Borsa Istanbul legislation. Over the years, our bank has expanded its banking product range to support to get through of settlement with instruments that include cash and non-cash loan opportunities. Addition to cash credit facilities, Takas Bank operates markets himself, such as Takas Bank Money Market, TPP, Turkey Electronic Mutual Fund Trading Platform, TEFAS, Turkey Electronic Pension Funds Trading Platform, BEFAS, and Securities Lending Market, RPP. Through these markets, Takas Bank offers cash and non-cash credit opportunities, and through banking facilities, our banking aims to complete settlement transactions of Turkish capital markets with minimizing risks, providing liquidity to the relevant money and capital markets, and without any errors and always on time. Besides, another important mission of Takas Bank is offering central counterparty services to its members by acting the role of buyer against seller and seller against buyer since 2013 in securities lending market, in Borsa Istanbul futures and options, Borsa Istanbul money, Borsa Istanbul equity, debt securities, Borsa Istanbul swap markets, and also in OTC derivatives. Our bank provides portfolio custody services to the securities mutual funds, mutual trusts, exchange traded funds, real estate mutual funds, and venture capital mutual funds since 2014. Also, we provide custody service for the capital market instruments through our accounts held at international central securities depositories like Euroclear and Clearstream and Global Custodians, Dibank. Thus, we provide access to more than 65 markets around worldwide. And with the Capital Markets Board's communique on equity-based based crowdfunding, we serve as an escrow agent where the fund collected through crowdfunding platforms will be blocked until transferred to the venture company or returned to the investors. Like this, we have a lot of important roles and specific instruments for Turkish financial system. And today I have a, a presentation here, and after talking about Takas Bank in detail, uh, we can now come to our main topic, the gold transfer system and the bigger project. Gold, especially physical gold, is a traditional investing instrument for Turkish people. Regarding gold savings, majority of Turkish people prefer to make their investments in physical gold. These investments are out of the financial system. It is estimated that amount of gold kept under the pillows or under the mattresses in Turkey have a value over 5,000 tons. So, if we can bring these savings into the financial system, it will be a huge source for our banking industry. Recent years, it has been conducted a few legislative arrangements to attract these savings. For example, Treasury has issued gold bonds and gold lease certificates, banking sector arranged gold days. These gold days, people who come to banks' branches give their physical gold savings to the banks and experts evaluated the savings regarding purity of gold and then it is replaced by the gold deposit accounts. Similarly, Central Bank of Turkey has allowed banks hold part of their reserve requirements in gold. Actually, we think that gold transfer system will be a key driver for this purpose because basically we will enhance the mobilization of the gold savings with this system. And today we have two agendas. Firstly, I would like to talk about the person-to-person -person gold transfer system. This system, which allows increasing the mobility of gold in the economy, bringing the gold under the mattress savings into the economy, and using gold as a means of payment instead of being a means of savings, has started to serve banks and their customers for four years. Thanks to the system, gold has been transferred at EFTC speed, and the gold transfer system, one of the most important components of the Istanbul Finance Center project, the new center of global finance has become a milestone in the development of Islamic finance in our country. Secondly, I would like to continue with the BIGA project. What is the BIGA project? What are we doing for it now? And what will we do in the future, inshallah? First of all, let me briefly explain gold transfer system. It enables customers to transfer their gold balances in their gold deposit accounts at banks, electronic environment. In other words, gold transfer is possible between banks as well as between end users. 
This project was developed to transfer gold registered on Takas Bank systems. It, has, it was launched on July 2018. Before this project, bank customers who wished to transfer gold between bank accounts had to convert it into Turkish lira or receive it as billion. Such transactions were costly, insecure, and time-consuming. Takas Bank Gold Transfer System is designed to mitigate these inconveniences, allowing customers to transfer gold between banks as easy as money transaction. More than 60,000 of transactions and nearly 30 tons of gold transfers were successfully carried out using Takas Bank Gold Transfer System in the last four years. Currently, there are more than 17 member banks, and together with the three major banks whose membership process continues, approximately 90% of the total gold volume in the Turkish banking system will be covered by the Takas Bank Gold Transfer System. In the gold transfer system, the physical equivalent of the transferred gold is kept in Borsa Istanbul vaults reserved for Takas Bank. Thus, the return of transfer is guaranteed by Takas Bank. We are now currently continuing our efforts to include other precious metals, starting from silver, into the gold transfer system and convert its name to precious metals transfer system in the next step. The system is currently operating efficiently in the Turkish financial markets. And this slide shows the general operational flow of gold transfer system. The system starts with the receiving of clients' transfer instructions by bank. Clients give their orders to their banks and then the related bank route these instructions directly to the gold transfer system platform and if there is sufficient gold balance in the gold pool, uh, the transaction is realized automatically. The system works within the operating hours so you can transfer your gold saving within the business days and between the operating hours. And on the other hand, our next topic is the BIGA project. We have started working on bigger project in 2017. This was the first project to be built on blockchain infrastructure and is still currently under development. Biga, which is abbreviation of one gram gold in Turkish, bir gram altın, is the name that we have given to the digital asset corresponding to one gram of gold. Biga enables secure, controlled, and confidential transfers of dematerialized gold, which has specific standards and physically stored in Borsa Istanbul vaults. Before moving on to the business model, I would like to mention about a few concepts. As Takas Bank, our main goal is to establish the infrastructure of the blockchain-based digital asset transfer platform. With the transfer platform that we have developed, we enable the transfer of all digital assets that we can transfer to the blockchain. More than one digital value can be represented at the same time on the platform. In the first stage, a model was made on gold and different models can will be created for other precious metals or other blockable assets in a short period. Blockchain-based digital asset transfer platform is a permissioned blockchain. Nodes must be members of the gold transfer system and are defined in the system with Takas Bank approval. Biga is also the name of the first digital asset traded on this platform. And Biga is not an asset created by mining. It is a value that can be issued against gold, physical gold, and which is physically stored in Borsa Istanbul vaults. After mentioning the basic concepts, we can move on to the business model. The members of Takas Bank Gold Transfer System transfer the amount of gold from the physical gold they store in Borsa Istanbul vaults to Takas Bank's dematerialized gold pool account. After that gold is dematerialized in their Takas Bank accounts for the digital transfers. Also, if they want, they can convert as one gram of dematerialized gold to one biga and export them to the portfolio account open in their own name on the blockchain. Thus, BIGA balances are formed on the blockchain in the relevant institution. Institutions can create accounts, wallets for their customers over the blockchain by keeping customer information in their conventional systems. Public keys like IBAN of the accounts that are created here shared with the customers and also private keys are stored in the relevant institution for transactions. 
After the transactions has been completed, the institution can convert its bigger balance on the blockchain into dematerialized gold and also dematerialized gold can be withdrawn physically from Borsa Istanbul walls within the framework of the current rules. When we analyzed the blockchain technology in order to use it in the financial system, we came across three basic requirements. The first of these requirements is the reliability of the transferred asset. This requirement is met by representing one gram of gold physically stored in Borsa Istanbul vaults for the transfer process as a digital asset, the underlying asset on the blockchain. And second, Due to the principle of decentralization, which is the basis of blockchain distributed ledger technology is used, this means that all data in the system is available on all nodes, but ensuring the privacy of the user's data, we created using some cryptological algorithms, and with this model, transactions are able to make sense only to parties of that transaction, even if data to transfer of transactions are in all nodes. And third one, one of the handicaps created by the decentralization principle of blockchain technology for the financial system is that it is not possible to monitor the transfers by an authority. In completely open systems like Bitcoin, anyone can investigate and make sense of all the data. And in completely closed systems, no one can make sense of the transfers as in zero knowledge proof algorithms. Both of these systems are not usable for the desired transfer platform. In this regard, a new model with a cryptological solution was created by working with Tubitak Bilgam Cryptology Laboratory. With this model, all transfer transactions in the system are encrypted with a cryptological algorithm whose key will be kept in the authority and can monitor the system with this key whenever it is needed. It was ensured that the transactions were not only interpreted by the parties of transfers and also could be monitored by an authority. The digital asset transfer platform, which was created and produced within the scope of solutions for the use of blockchain technology in the financial system, was created with the member banks, the first known blockchain network in banking. All tests were completed and the real environment pilot stage was completed. The achievements we want to gain with bigger project are as follows, increasing the mobility of gold in our economy, building a 724 working blockchain network in Turkish financial ecosystem that complies with regulation and at the same time provides privacy. We want to increase our blockchain knowledge and experience day by day and contribute to blockchain ecosystem. And in the near future, we first want to expand the use of Piga on the end user side together with the member banks we have made pilot stage together and here I would like to thank Mr. Metin and Zirat Participation Bank for their contributions during the development phase and then increase the number of Piga members starting with the gold transfer system members. Then I'm on business side of this project, but we will do some upgrades at the IT side. We are doing some work on consensus algorithms, trying to upgrade better zero knowledge proof algorithms, various monitoring and management tools, digital identities, and of course, in the end, safe mobile wallet applications. Inshallah, these are some of our future plans for Biga. And as a final word, I think I don't even need to say that the international use of Biga is also among our goals. And I greet you all respectfully. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, uh, don't hesitate to contact our team. We will be happy to answer your questions. Please write us. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Saito Özgel, uh, for your very important and very, very wealthy uh, presentation. And, uh, uh, physically or practically, practically using of the gold uh, in the payment system, and hopefully uh, we will see that uh, using of the gold as an alternative payment system in international area. Inshallah. Uh, inshallah, inshallah. Uh, hopefully. And uh, as we know very well that uh, after the especially COVID-19 pandemic crisis, uh, we entered a new period: uh, centralization and decentralization system. <coughs> The, the name called by lots of financial systems. And we know that after that period, uh, lots of new terms uh, in our agenda, such as big data, uh, cryptocurrency, digital currency, 
and the fintechs, these are new normals, and one of the most important things uh, I emphasize that new normal. After the COVID-19, uh, lots of experts say that uh, after that period, there would be new normal period. What is the new normal? What is the normal? What was the normal? Or what, uh, what will be the new normal after the COVID-19 pandemic crisis? And uh, as I said before that, this centralization process, it, uh, which means that uh, lots of time uh, they, they refuse to authority printing money or, or unlimited printing money by governments. And they allege in this system, the centralization system uh, will, be, will be independent from the authority of the government. When the government want to print money uh, when they need for lots of reasons, they can't do that because the digital system and the decentralization system and cryptocurrency, digital currency will not allow that system anymore. That's just allegation. And uh, I just mean, uh, or trying to mean that what's the difference between the COVID-19 and after the COVID-19, especially in the financial area. Today's panel, uh, or aim was uh, to introduce the gold uh, might be an, uh, as an alternative payment model uh, throughout the world. And practically, thank you very much, Mr. Saitos, and uh, you talked to us about that issue. Uh, in domestically, we started just in Turkey, but hopefully uh, in the future, uh, we can see that process uh, commonly throughout the world. And again, nowadays, just briefly, I want to emphasize again, uh, alternative payment systems. What's the importance of the alternative payment system? As we know, as you all know very well, that there's a clash or war, sometimes different uh, terms they are using people, uh, clash and war between the Ukraine and uh, Russia. And uh, yeah, of course, mm, the war, we don't want, and it is an acceptable thing uh, by the humanity perspective. Uh, we don't want to die innocent people, ladies, children, never, never and ever. But financial perspective is different. We know, uh, we, we, we know and we saw that lots of countries, lots of countries, especially Switzerland, and started to uh, impose sanctions about uh, some of the transaction, uh, some of the property, of the personal property and the country's property somewhere all over the world. And logically, yeah, for the, from the financial perspective, it is not an acceptable, it is an acceptable thing. And some countries want to uh, impose some sanction. The other countries, uh, it is unlogic, it's unacceptable things. And sometimes uh, remove the, their banking system uh, from international banking system. Commonly, commonly uh, says that civil system. Um, one country says that, yeah, ah, we, we have decided to remove you from the international banking system. Why? Yeah, because some of the sanctions you, you want to, we want to something to do for you, but you don't do that. Yeah, like that. Uh, there are lots of discussion and we need, of course, uh, after the uh, discussion, uh, I will give you the uh, opportunity for the questions. And just a very brief information about that. After the COVID-19 pandemic crisis, that's the new period. And uh, we, should, uh, we should be ready, ready for different things for new normal in, in all area, especially in the finance area. And for that reason, we have to prepare, we have to take some necessary action uh, about that before uh, we have that kind of problems. So we came to the end of the panel, and uh, uh, if you want, uh, we have some questions, if you have time, Mr. We have time? Okay. Uh, first, yeah, I will come. Firstly, uh, you said, please. Please. 
Rami Bey, Metin Bey, and Said Bey for the amazing panel. Thank you. Uh, kind. When you think about it, gold was before printed money. So money has become an alternative payment for gold. So human being from the history Metin Bey has highlighted. So I think the question is, the future is digital gold. And I think what Said Bey has highlighted is so important in terms of creating the digital wallet as a future plan, the future plans you highlighted. Yes. Uh, and President Erdogan yesterday made an announcement. It is the time for digital mobilization, he mentioned. So to your point, Ilhami Bey. So what I see is the Islamic world, the entire Ummah, has to build its own financial tools, including Turkey, as one of the leaders in this area, and especially Istanbul. So any war happen or any other catastrophe happens, we have our own independence in terms of financial. So this is as if dying or living. Your panel is that much important. And I'm very curious about, uh, I will read the uh, you know, white paper you mentioned, Said Bey. Uh, it was an excellent presentation. My question is, you know, with the digital wallet, do you expect lots of international flow uh, globally as a gold, uh, utilizing uh, Takas Bank system. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Yavuz. Uh, Biga is in the early stage now, and uh, we are now uh, designing the domestic uh, project with all the participant banks is in the uh, member stage. Also, we talk with Malaysia, uh, Pakistan, Azerbaijan. Uh, they are um, interesting with Biga. The big problem is uh, physical gold stored on the countries, that countries, and central banks of these countries must be um, uh, talk with each other. Maybe uh, then it will be a good project for international use of Biga. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's a very good question. Thank you very much for your question. It was very important and very good question. Yes, please. Yes, yes, yes. Ah, okay, microphone. <clears throat> uh, thank you so much for, for this session. My name is Yazan Abdin, and I'm here from the US. Um, I saw that, uh, like, sorry, this is just, um, just doing quick research now, but I see that Takas Bank is a participant in the money market settlement fund between the reserves of the, of the banks. Is that correct? Uh, can you please help? Central Bank, the Fem Takas Bank, and Asia Bank, or whatever Asia Bank. No, no. Takas Bank is a subsidiary of Borsa Istanbul Group, so is a special uh, institution, but uh, uh, has got many uh, important roles in capital markets of Turkey. Okay. Not a Central Bank of Turkey's uh, subsidiary. Okay. Uh, my question is about actually the reserves of gold that will be held with Takas Bank. Um, Will the participating banks in this be allowed to issue credit against that reserve? Uh, yani, I think Ziraat Katılım, Kuwait Turk, they are uh, giving credit uh, via uh, gold, physical gold. But Takas Bank uh, only cash and non-cash credits to uh, capital markets or banks, not uh, end users. Takas Bank is not in the end user side. Okay, but this feels like it's creating the same problems as, you know, that, that already exist now because, like, at the end, it's actually maybe a little bit worse because if there is uh, extended credit based on uh, gold as the reserve, then, then maybe, you know, that will be a run on the bank uh, in creating, you know, getting that gold and there isn't enough reserve in that while the central bank can actually at some point uh, support the reserves and be a backstop for the system. So I'm just interested to see how, like, how you guys are thinking about this and willing to handle it. Can you summarize? Yes, please. For uh, me. Esas problem, yani bu uh, bankanın merkez bankasında uh, rezerv olarak bloke edilmesi şeyi var ya, zorunluluğu var ya, mm -hmm. onu nasıl aşacaksınız, onu uh, yani... Yes, yes, we are talking with Central Bank of Turkey. They are studying on it. Uh, and uh, I would like to mention that um, in the end user side of Biga, we are doing some business with participation banks and the other banks whose membership is in Biga. 
So um, after that, Biga is not on the credit side. Biga is the transfer, uh, transferable asset. So maybe a payment method, the next step, inshallah. Thank you. Central Bank of Turkey, yes. It's in the project now, but it is in the early stage. Mm -hmm. We are doing some development. After that, the uh, Central Bank of Turkey is in the stage, inshallah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, inshallah, can you take one or two more questions and then we can go okay. to the next one? Is okay. Next. Okay, just one for lady, ladies first, always, ah, please, yes. Assalamu alaikum, uh, my name is Khawla, I come here from Tunisia. Uh, it's uh, such wonderful presentation, thank you so much. Thank and uh, uh, what you are doing, I hope it will succeed and it is uh, a game changing for, uh, uh, for the situation uh, that we are facing now with uh, all the problems with dollar and uh, so on and so forth. Um, uh, as the brother uh, said, before money, paper money, we, we used to use uh, gold. gold. But not only gold, also silver, also other kinds of metals. Are you thinking of using these kinds of metals? Mm -hmm. And why not also oil or anything, asset uh, that we can use to back uh, <laughs> currencies? Also, uh, one bigger is one gram. But uh, one gram... Um, uh, it is, it is, we cannot use it for small transactions. I know that you are now uh, concentrating on uh, big transactions with international transactions, but why not uh, using it as a currency in everyday transactions to buy anything? And uh, it is 100% digital with mobile phone, and we know that uh, m uh, gold or silver, or it is in, in the central bank, and uh, we change all our life like that. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. It is our main goal of uh, Biga, inshallah. And uh, about silver, uh, in this year, uh, gold transfer system, uh, we are changing its name to precious metals transfer system and including silver, inshallah. Also, Biga uh, can be created by silver, uh, kept in the Borsa Istanbul vaults, the physical silver. Uh, also, not precious metals, uh, equities, debt securities, uh, uh, blockable assets, we can convert it to this platform. And uh, the main thing is, Biga is uh, not only an asset, Biga is the transfer platform that we created for transfers. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. And uh, uh, the, yeah, before you, and I think you want to ask some questions. Uh, there, there's a microphone, yes, please. Um, Jazakumullah, I want to say, mashallah, I think it's amazing what you're doing in terms of bringing gold as, as an asset, as it should be used. Uh, Allah gave value to gold, we know this. Even our zakat, we pay through gold. Yes. So, mashallah, to bring it back. Um, I just want to make a comment, if that's okay. I think when we have the presentations and people are focusing on what you, you do or anyone else, the solution for an Islamic ecosystem, a financial ecosystem, everyone has a part to play. And I think moving towards a, a, a gold standard or a gold means is a huge part of this. And I really welcome your uh, comments that actually there's a huge political side to this. And um, the conventional financial system is one of effective slavery, if you adopt of it. Course. And this is a means of freedom. Mashallah. So I think we really welcome what you're doing. You're an example, inshallah, for all of these other countries that you mentioned, and we really hope for your success, inshallah. Inshallah. And uh, we hope everyone else here can uh, participate and support it as well. Together, inshallah. Inshallah. I mean, uh, thank, thank you very you. much. That thank you very much. Good, good words and, uh, for us. And I think the l last question for you. It yes. will be the last question. Mr. Yavuz Selim. Yeah, Yavuz Selim. <laughs> yeah. Microphone is coming. <coughs> I don't want to take too much time from the other panel, but in terms of you know, digital Turkish lira, you know, that is mm. now in place. The question is, like the question sister asked, just in addition to her question, can we use you know, 
between the nations a digital currency, not just as a transfer, but your currency, Takas Bank will introduce from Turkey's central bank and utilize Turkish, you know, a digital currency. Uh, not you know, Turkish, it's uh, based it's on, gold, yeah, on gold, uh, international. But, but, but do you think that uh, that currency can be announced and can be also utilized in crypto markets and other markets globally? No. The, the central banks don't want to uh, do this with crypto. It's an alternative method, and what the panel's name is an alternative method. Uh, and international use is uh, working now. We are talking with other countries. They are very interesting in this project. Inshallah, uh, next years maybe uh, we will do that. We we'll do this together. I mean, the crypto market is growing. So eventually, you know, the central banks have to take a position one way or another. It's like a tsunami coming. So uh, can you just say? They, they, um, they must come here. Okay. This is regulatory uh, payment gotcha. They have to be regulated, basically. Yes, yes. And this. we're expecting new regulations for crypto anyway in Turkey. So I think with that, maybe. That maybe they good. say this is uh, regulate compliance this method don't go there please come here I see okay <laughs> thank you so much I yeah I, Mr. Yavuz, I, I want to add something to, uh, yeah the, as I said before that it is a, the cryptocurrency system based on the centralization or decentralization of system course. sometimes if, if you want to regulate the cryptocurrency in the in the financial system it means that centralization and they don't want to that and they don't want to be independent in the system so it's named decentralization yes and yeah so that's it i will talk from about the other that. perspective it's about supply DAO. and demand yes, i'll talk about that at the end of the last panel yes including islamic DAO. but the question is we need to close the panel because we have to uh, <laughs> we're, we're an hour behind time we will we will continue yeah. on the coffee yeah. break i will talk with you yeah yeah, yeah. inshallah okay. Thank you so thank much. You, you. Sorry, I apologize. No uh, barakallahu thank, thank, thank you so much, everyone. Inshallah, we will go straight into our next session. It's a great pleasure to see you all. And I want to thank you, the panel before us. It was very live. And I'm sure it will not be uh, boring in our session. It will be also live as, as your session. My name is Samir. Uh, I am from Azerbaijan. I work in uh, ICD, and I'm covering uh, CIS and Europe countries for ICD uh, in the region. And today, my CEO already spoke about ICD and in his welcoming message. So I'm not going to uh, talk about ICD, and I will be happy to share after the uh, coffee break or lunch time about ICD, how we work, what we can do on this. Just want to tell you that as ICD, we are standing always ready with our partners to support them in their uh, work related to FinTech. As you know, ICD uh, started to announce every year a FinTech award, a global award, and one of the winners are here with us. Uh, his name is Abdullah. He's a founding shareholder of Alif Bank from Tajikistan. They work actively in, in uh, Uzbekistan and in Central Asia. So I encourage you to meet with him. He will be after lunch uh, session, and he's here. Assalamu alaikum wa Abdullah. He was a winner of FinTech Award uh, last year, which we did. Um, today I have, uh, as you can see, a very uh, interesting panel. So I'm going to go to introducing them. Then I will ask them to give two, three minutes about what they do and the challenges and the opportunities they, they have in their own respective countries. Uh, with me, we have Raza Amel. He is the chief executive officer of United Bank of Albania. It is a bank located in Albania where Islamic Development Bank also is a shareholder. Welcome to our session. Pleasure. Uh, Thank you. Mr. Amel uh, was head of retail banking in Bosnia. He was also ambassador of Bosnia and Herzegovina in China. So he also was a uh, minister on regional level, minister of finance regional level in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, uh, he has his master's degree and undergraduate degree from International Islamic University of Malaysia. So welcome again to our session. Our second speaker will be Mr. Khalid. Mr. Khalid has MBA degree from Cranfield, also computer science degree. 
Mr. Khalid for the last two decades worked for investment bank in MENA region and currently he is founding a boutique agency advise Muslim internet entrepreneurs in building camel businesses. He's, he currently sits on the board of ATS Global, which is a leading Islamic crowdfunding platform in Asia, and offers Sharia-based funding for startups, scale-ups, and social enterprises. Mr. Khalid is full-time based in Istanbul, and he will be sharing with us his experience and knowledge how, his, how startups and fintechs are uh, uh, facing their issues and challenges. Mr. Khalid, happy to welcome you in our Glad session. To our third speaker uh, will be a member of management board of Afenish Venture Fund from Iran. Sister Mitra, welcome to our uh, session. Uh, she was a CEO of Urban Innovation Catalyst and project manager and senior consultant on diverse projects in, in, in Iran. And currently, she is the CEO of uh, Venture Capital Fund, which invests to startups. And they are planning to exit one of the startups successfully. And we will hear what's happening in Iran under the sanctions, under all the challenges, how they're surviving, and how the venture capital and startup fintech industry is growing. Uh, she has a PhD degree from Shahid Behirst University and Master MBA from University of Tehran. Our last speaker will be an uh, innovative young innovator. Uh, he's the founder of Yalla Technology Limited. It is an Islamic fintech startup set to launch in April this year. Congratulations. And also, uh, what they do, they provide financial products and services to understand Muslims globally. Thank you, Sharif, Thank for you. coming and being with us today. Thank you very much. So, I uh, was told by our uh, organizers that we have, if we can finish 10 minutes earlier, he will give me a word. So, I'm going <laughs> to be uh, nice on time. So, uh, my question will be to Mr. Amil, uh, as we know each other a long time, and we are already working together in Albania. Uh, I know that in your bank, you want to start something new. Uh, can you tell us what you want to do? Yes. Thank you. First of all, I would like to say thank you for your invitation to this uh, very respected uh, event, and we are going to learn a lot from each other here. Hopefully, uh, uh, this is going to create some kind of synergy between different institutions, different participants, fintechs, to be penetrating different markets. Uh, in Albania, uh, there is a bank called United Bank of Albania, which is uh, Islamic bank or trying to be or striving to be Islamic bank in an uh, environment which is not having Islamic banking law, so we are trying to be Sharia compliant, also to follow the uh, legislation of Albanian Alien Central Bank. So the bank is relatively small and uh, before one and a half year I came to be a CEO and we tried to build up some kind of strategy which is going to uh, make a turnaround management to penetrate the market, to rebrand the, the, the bank, to introduce new products and services, which are going to create a superior customer experience and to try to penetrate market uh, at, at stage which is going to be sustainable for us. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, we have a competitors. The competitors are big European uh, banking corporations which are having economy of scale, market penetration, so it is not easy for a small Islamic bank uh, to actually to, to position itself in the market, but also uh, uh, um, to have uh, identify itself as Islamic bank in a market which is not so much interested in Islamic, in Islamic, in Islamic uh, value, values and worldviews. So what we have decided to do, we want to be as a good halal restaurant in some environment which is not necessarily Muslim environment. So if you want to be successful restaurant in Vienna, or in Rome, in London, uh, you have to have, a, first of all, excellent food, superior, superior service, interior and everything else. What are the recipes you are using? Doesn't matter, more or less, to the general public. To the Muslims, yes, you, you, you, they are having a particular, particular concern about what is, what is the recipe. But in general, people would like to have competitive, high-quality product with customer experience and convenience. 
So this is what we are trying to do in Albania, to try to position ourselves as a, uh, a boutique cafe bank, which is going to uh, leverage on, um, on uh, information technology in order to bring uh, superior customer experience. So we are building the first ever Islamic fin uh, fintech uh, in, in Southeast Europe, which is uh, going to bring us a murabaha based uh, platform, uh, which is going to be end-to-end -end, uh, digital, from authentication to disbursement, everything is going to be digital in the shops of our strategic partners. So a customer will go to, to the retail shop to buy a fridge, to, to buy a whatever, you know, co a rice cooker, and he is uh, going to be able to uh, um, get financing in the retail shop without signing the document, without any kind of interaction, in the physical interaction with the bank, but digital. Uh, thanks to a very conducive digital environment we have in Albania, we are going to actually, we are partnering uh, with uh, three different uh, institutions which are providing us a databases for uh, biometrics, for financial uh, and socioeconomic indicators of particular client, uh, and we are making a scoring, approving and disbursing of the uh, financing in a in, in, in matter of, of the minutes. So this is going to bring us a new customer, this is going to bring us uh, cross-selling opportunities, and this is going to be uh, some kind of proud that we have something totally new for the Albanian market, and the Islamic financial institution is doing it first. Thank you. Thank you. Mashallah. Thank you very much. So you are controlling the voices. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Great, great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the, the, w the way how I want to run the session, that each speaker will uh, speak about what they do. Then we go to question and answer session, which I found more interesting and more live. So with your permission, Mr. Khalid, I have a question for you. <laughs> okay, uh, So what exactly you do in Istanbul? So I moved to Istanbul um, um, uh, in August. Uh, before that, for 20 years, I've been in the, uh, in the GCC. Uh, I started in conventional investment banking, so I was your typical hardcore investment banker. Uh, looking to make money in, in every possible way, uh, up until I stumbled across uh, you know, some, uh, some, some scholars, and it was the, the beginning of the, the journey uh, into Islamic finance. And then I saw what's happening in, in Turkey, and it was a good time uh, uh, to move here. So I relocated completely uh, with my business, with my family, to, uh, to Turkey, because of various reasons. One of them is the, the opportunity that exists in Islamic finance, uh, you know, uh, Turkey leading the way um, in, um, in setting this up. Uh, you see this at the national level, uh, whether these are the different departments and the different committees under the presidency, but also the infrastructure. Um, and I guess when I arrived here, and I think some of the things that, uh, you know, were told by uh, some, uh, some uh, Turkish friends, is uh, they're always, the grass is much greener from, from, from the outside. So when you tell them about what they currently have here that is not available in, in, in neighboring countries, uh, uh, primarily in the GCC and, and these kind of things, they get surprised because they, they, live, they live here. Uh, so when you bring to, uh, to the discussion um, the, the involvement that, uh, you know, uh, seeing how, you know, the Dubai has, has set up the JFX or Doha has set up IF, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, uh, the International Financial Center or what uh, Saudi Arabia is, is doing. And you look at what the infrastructure is available here, it's, it's far beyond uh, what, is, what is available. Uh, and it's, it's a good fertile uh, place to, uh, you know, to build businesses and to grow businesses here. Okay, I have a question mm -hmm. in terms of, because you work with startups and fintechs. Yes. What challenge they have? Yeah. What they want? So uh, the, the I think one of the, the key things that you know, uh, we see in the, in the startups, especially when it comes to, uh, to entrepreneurs, is, is, the, is the mindset. Uh, whether this mindset is uh, pertaining to the infrastructure, the, where they currently live, and they always think that um, if I move to Europe, or if I move to the States, or if I move to the GCC, then uh, they will appreciate me more, I will get better funding, you know, the, the, the. so they always see that, you know, outside is better than, than, uh, than the inside. So the, the, the issue of the mindset is, is, is 
uh, is, a, is, a crucial, uh, is a crucial thing. One of the things that um, uh, I started to see, for example, dealing with a lot of entrepreneurs uh, here is that they don't appreciate that they have uh, availability of, of talent, human, uh, human capital, that is trained on doing hard things. Uh, get an entrepreneur, for example, and uh, let them live by the beach or in a nice fancy building, you know, getting a, a fancy car they lose that entrepreneurial spirit. They, they, they lose that, uh, you have to go for the, for the kill. They lose this grit that is required actually to set up a company from, uh, from the get-go. This is something that is embedded in this culture. Um, everybody's working, everybody's productive, everybody is running uh, you know, uh, in order to, to make, uh, to make end, ends meet. And this is the essence, and this is the core essence of, of, of a good entrepreneur. Uh, so. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Khalid. Uh, let's move to our sister. Uh, sister Mitra, what's happening in Iran now in terms uh, of venture capital? Let's first say uh, salam to everyone. Uh, and uh, as a venture capitalist and someone who was active in the innovation ecosystem of Iran, I should admit that uh, fintech startups are very appealing to invest. But uh, um, I think everybody knows that under the sanctions that we are um, now, uh, it's, it's really hard to uh, scale up the startups and it's, it's our uh, main challenge uh, in Iran. Uh, but uh, I, I should say that uh, for everybody here, uh, I guess it's, it's uh, clear and vivid that the opportunities in FinTech is so much and great. Uh, but the main challenge is the regulation framework, which didn't catch up the pace of technology in this uh, field. Uh, and I think in uh, Islamic countries, because we have something written as regulation of finance, uh, we can get this opportunity to uh, make uh, such a framework for at least our own countries and at the same time maybe to export it and uh, demonstrate it to other countries too, uh, to, to be the first, um, in my opinion. Uh, so I think the challenge is more important now to, to, uh, to for everyone to uh, go and find a solution to overcome that. Mm -hmm. So let's say if I want to start a fintech business in Iran, I need to get permission from government of Iran or I can do it? Uh, it, it, it depends. We have a central bank that has uh, some, some regulations that you should obey them. But uh, for, for example, let's say uh, cryptocurrency and blockchain and other uh, technologies that are now uh, emerging in, uh, and, and you know, I should say thanks to sanctions, we are making and uh, developing everything from the scratch in Iran. So uh, we have uh, mm, uh, a great know-how and a great opportunity of the uh, talents which uh, can, can do everything. And I'm happy to, uh, to announce it here. But at the same time, it's hard to scaling them up. Uh, and um, I, I hope with decentralization, which is the um, harbinger, in my opinion, of justice, for especially the third world countries and underdeveloped countries, uh, we, can, we can overcome soon to this uh, financial issue. Okay, so I have a question. Let's say you have a very good successful FinTech in Iran. Yes. They're looking for to go to other markets and they're not in sanction list. What do you do on this matter? Do you help them as a government, as a venture capital fund? Uh, you know, uh, government-wise, they don't come to, to help them, actually. But uh, as we are the private sector, we are going to, to make everything and provide everything for them if they want to, to go out of the country. But uh, here, I, I think we have an opportunity to make a collaboration between uh, Islamic countries because uh, what happens on the table of the politicians is not related to people. And uh, I think uh, our 80 million population country is a great opportunity, especially for uh, MENA countries and Middle East, uh, to uh, use this talent pool and uh, you know do something great. Thank you. Thank Welcome. you. We'll come back with more questions. I'm just going to go to Sheriff. Sheriff, tell us what you bring difference in April. There is so much websites, so much. Uh, on the online, you can accept this. So what Yalla will make a difference? 
Um, um, good afternoon, everybody, and it's, it's great being here. Um, so, I, I don't know if anybody know about the fintech space in Nigeria right now. Like it's really booming. Um, we are one of the biggest um, country that has raised a lot of money when it comes to fintech. However, with the Islamic fintech, we don't have just even one raised any money yet. You know, and that's because. Um, the conventional space of fintech is really growing, money is pouring around from Silicon Valley, people are raising money every day. Um, and it has actually moved the Muslims away from what we should be doing. You know, you find out that some of these conventional fintechs are being owned by Muslims who are supposed to be creating product for us. But of course, because there's that notion where you're not going to get funding if you want to create a product targeted at Muslims, then you see them moving there. But for me, I, I look at it and say, I need to build products in line with what I believe and what my faith is. Hence the reason why um, I started up Yala. So a brief background into before Yala, I run a media company for over a decade. I studied filmmaking in Central Film School. And I also seriously focused on um, Islamic media at the time, but one of the challenges that we realized was we do not have a lot of Islamic businesses to, to um, cater for um, revenue generation for the media company. Um, because of course you need to advertise Islamic finance products, but there are not enough, a lot of banks. So in Nigeria you have about 25 or 30 conventional banks and you just have about three Islamic institution, Islamic banks. And trust me, one of those banks are bigger than the three other ones, you know, in Nigeria. So, and now their focus is not even on the millennials or the Gen Zs who actually need products that they could relate with. They're just focusing on the older generations. And like there's a lot of underserved young people we need products that could appeal to them, but they can't find it. So the challenge is, yes, you're telling people about Mudaraba or Musharaka or Ijara, all of this product, or you're telling them to come and bank with you, but your, your, for lack of a better word, your internet banking is not as great as the ones they use in the conventional one, so they don't care. Um, and now there's a new trend in Nigeria now where microfinancing is the thing young people go out and get smaller loans, you know, and all of that. So there, there isn't any product catering to that. So we set out to say, you know what, we would create this product for the Gen, Gen Zs and the millennials to say, you know, you can, be, you can invest, you can save in line with your faith, and you can have that kind of experience that you get from the conventional one in terms of user experience, user journey, um, the the flow of the harp and all of that, all of that. And also because um, what some of those companies, when you bank with them, they are not catering to you. They tell you, oh, do you want to turn off interest? Yes or no, then you press turn off interest. You who are Muslims. So what that means is even when you save your money with them, you don't get returns on it. So we don't want you to turn off interest because when you're with us, the interest is you. So we would make sure that when you're saving your, your money with us, it's being invested in Sharia compliant product and you're getting return on your investment. So that niche market is what we're trying to target now. We have over, um, Nigeria is over 200 million and Muslims are like 60%. You know, so we have like over 100 million Muslims who are underserved. You know, so it's a big market, but there's a lot of challenges as well. But you know where there's a problem then perhaps that's where you should be looking at. So that's the space we're playing in right now. Thank you, Sharif. Good luck. It's very challenging, especially yeah, the market where Islamic finance is not there. So, is not yet. Yeah, so with this, I want to thank all of our uh, speakers. And I'm going to give floor to our uh, audience. If there's any question to any of our speakers, including me, we'll be happy to answer. So who want to go first? Please go ahead.
including Turkey, what are the top countries you want to operate in and where are you operating right now? So definitely Nigeria is one of, uh, one of them. Uh, Turkey is another. Uh, <laughs> numbers are. Uh, <laughs> it's, at the end of the day, we, we follow the, the, the crowd. So you know, with, with anything that is, uh, so first, the, the first question, thanks for the question. Uh, so with the global license uh, that was obtained in, um, uh, you know, from Oman, that means any, um, any startup or scale up uh, regardless of where it is incorporated, uh, they can actually uh, seek funding from a, a global crowd. The crowd, by design, is, is global, meaning is we have uh, uh, different you know, funders from across the world, f from the US to, uh, to Europe, uh, Africa, uh, Asia. So the, from a crowd perspective, it's an international crowd that has invested in, um, in companies, uh, whether this is for the Indonesian uh, platform, whether this was for the Malaysian platform or uh, the other platforms that we have. Now, even, co even companies that are raising capital uh, can raise capital uh, using the, the, the, the global, uh, the global uh, license. As long as it doesn't conflict with the local regulations and it, it's, it doesn't come across as being, you know, bypassing these kind of things, uh, bypassing the, the, the regulations. So, for example, uh, you know, one of the, you know, going back to the issue of, of mindset and, and, and these kind of things, and I feel, you know, uh, what Brother Sharif is, is mentioning, because most of the entrepreneurs that we deal with, they, sometimes they come across as being apologetic about being, you know, uh, visibly Muslims, and, you know, these are the kind of things. And it's, it's okay. It's because now with the crowdfunding and these kind of things, these are the kind of crowd that actually wants to invest in your business. Uh, and the, it is much easier to look at alternative financing mechanisms, whether this is raising money from the crowd, whether this actually, uh, you know, we have Venture. some entrepreneurs yes. here that, you know, uh, the, they were funded by their suppliers. So uh, if they are collaborating, for example, with banks and, and these kind of things, some of these banks, once they see um, a good team on the ground, they're solving a real problem, they would actually advance them. And this is the essence of, of, of Islamic finance, like, be it Istisna or these kind of things. They will actually finance them to build a product that is used later on by the, by the, by the bank. So you don't have to uh, be a unicorn. You don't have, you know, as long as you focus on building a profitable business. business. Uh, and actually we favor, and uh, unlike sister, you know, I come from the, the, the VC world and these kind of things, but now, there might be an opportunity for micro businesses as long as you can start to think about the unit economics, uh, you know how you're generating, uh, you know funding, and being mindful and creative, uh, looking at alternative uh, financing mechanism, supplier credit, uh, raising money from uh, from the crowd, whether this is actual uh, for a project that you want to uh, to to set up or as uh, as, uh, as shareholders. Uh, so, uh, with crowdfunding, it allows a lot of these, uh, whether it's on the equity side or project finance side. Do you have plans to use blockchain technology? As in, blockchain is a, is a, is a database, so are we talking... Blockchain technology, do you use it with crowdfunding? We, so, uh, we have... So one of the payment methods that we have on the platform is, is cryptos. So we actually, uh, we, uh, you know, uh, some of the, the, the funders, whether uh, on Global Sadaqa, which is the social finance uh, platform, uh, it allows, uh, so we, had, we had clients that are paying their zakat in, uh, in Bitcoin. So uh, I think we were, uh, we were one of the first organizations, not the first, uh, to actually allow Paying in gold, so uh, we have a deal with uh, a company that deals with uh, like what the guys are from the Kazbank Bank we're, we're doing. So some of the clients are paying their zakat in either digital gold or they're paying it in uh, in cryptos. So beyond crypto, are you applying blockchain and in terms of DAO or other areas uh, uh, as a technology? We will. We it depends on each and every country whether this is. Uh, but again, if if a country, for example, so one of the things that is in favor for, uh, you know, for, for Turkey, for example, is the infrastructure is, um, 
is really up there if we compare it to other markets uh, that we, uh, we operate, uh, operate in. So for example, you have something like Findex, which is you know, the sort of like the retail credit, uh, credit uh, rating. That's a very important uh, you know, part of the, of the ecosystem uh, needed by crowdfunding in order to assess the credit worthiness of the, of the counterparty, whether this counterparty is a company that is raising uh, capital towards a project. You are able to access this data uh, in order to say, is this person credit you know credit worthy person, uh, you know, and, and these kind of things. Now, with the with the move uh, from a, from a national perspective to digital lira and, and whatnot, that means you can start having you know smart contracts. So the mudaraba. So currently we're doing it in musharakas, um, uh, musharakas uh, and uh, and uh, and mudarabas. So once you have a digital currency, be it gold-based or be it digital lira-based, uh, that means you can convert you know, these mudarabas and, uh, uh, and, uh, and murabahas into digital, you know, smart contracts, which get settled once it's, uh, it's, it's done. Uh, so this is, this is already, uh, you know, Turkey is a, a ahead of the curve if we compare it uh, to, uh, to other markets. Yes, of course. Okay. Then I, will uh, I want just to inform you that in Iran we are making uh, a kind of meta VC, which is based on that technology that you are uh, trying to define. And if you are eager, I can explain more about that. Thanks. Thank you, Abdullah. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Yeah. Um, yeah. Abdullah from Alif. Uh, my question is to Sister Mitra. Um, I want to understand about the IT talent in Iran, is, do you think is, it's a good opportunity to set up a IT uh, software development team in Iran? Can you tell about this a bit more, please? Sure, thanks. Uh, you know, actually, it's something that we are, uh, um, due to the sanctions, we, are, we have limitations for selling and importing, exporting things. But with the services, which one of them is the uh, technical services, which is the talent pool that we have for the development and uh, programmers that are working over there. We are thinking of making a kind of uh, development factory, which uh, can give services to outside the country too. Uh, and uh, yet, with uh, the bless of uh, cryptocurrency, at least we can uh, have, we can find some ways to uh, even pay them. And uh, I think, yes, there is a, a great opportunity over there for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, question? Yes. Two more questions and we are finishing. Thank uh, thanks to the panel, Hossein Marashi here from Noor. I had two questions, one uh, for our own startup. First of all, what is the golden criteria that you guys look for when you're talking about a startup that looks like it's going to be successful? And what is the one thing that every startup should think about incorporating? Because my take from, from the few hours I was here was we should start thinking about uh, implementing new payment ga gateways, ICD, the BIRA, and all of that stuff for our startup. That's my first question. My second question is more general. When we're talking about Islamic uh, financing, are we ever talking about a system that protects our fellow Muslims from foreign sanctions and economic pressures that's coming out from, that's coming from non-Islamic countries? Do we ever talk about that kind of subject? Thank you very much. So, please go ahead, yes. <laughs> I'm the most talkative mm -hmm. one, I guess. You are the one with the microphone, that's why. <laughs> yeah, you're the one with the power of the microphone, yeah. Thanks. Uh, you know, uh, um, I think that, um, for the investors, and if I want to uh, look at the subject of the startups uh, from my point of view, uh, we think of, uh, you know, uh, a, a very successful exit, which has different ways for a startup. Uh, but uh, in, in other point of view, I should say that uh, if a startup can uh, scale up well, and has good impact and also has uh, a way to add more uh, bus business lines and uh, uh, revenue streams for uh, other teams that are going to be small businesses as well. It's going to be a success for a startup. Uh, for the other question, <laughs> maybe. I would like to add, if, if, if possible. Uh, Mic microphone for you. Uh, 
what is the bottom line, what Islamic finance is supposed to do, and we are actually maybe having a problem of understanding that we are actually wasting the possibility of uh, creating something, some new added value to Islamic finance uh, using and leveraging on technology. A convergence between Islamic finance and especially Islamic banking and, and conventional banking is very, you know, how can I say, uh, illustrative, it's there. And it is very difficult to distinguish uh, uh, uh, what is the value added Islamic financial institution is providing compared to that one of conventional banking. So using the technology, we should s make one step back and try to contemplate what actually Islamic banking or Islamic finance is supposed to provide to society. What are the problems, social economic problems, which we are going to answer through Islamic finance? Not uh, regardless whether we are talking about Muslim or non-Muslim clients. So each country has its own socioeconomic problems. Islamic finance, if there is no, if there is no solution for those socioeconomic problems, does not need to exist. We need to be there to provide a solutions. We are problem solvers for different social economic problems of each society. And we have to think big and we have to think out of the box in order to provide such kind of solutions to, to the particular uh, unprivileged strata of our societies. This is one, one part in retail, in corporate, in different, different, different, different stages. So uh, the, having in mind that uh, technology which is arising, which is already present here, is going to give us a tremendous opportunities in different fields to create uh, ecosystems which are going to actually help uh, different pa interesting parties, different stakeholders in society to engage where we are going to be facilitators and to channel and to allocate the resources into the right direction. This, I believe, should be a future of Islamic financial institutions using and uh, powering uh, itself on, on technologies which are available now. And the synergy between banking sector and fintech institutions or, or, or whatever uh, uh, technological uh, advancements which you can uh, create should be uh, uh, glued together by some kind of joint strategy which is going to solve certain socioeconomic problems. Otherwise, we are going to copy and paste, paste and copy uh, from what is already uh, happening in some other parts of the world while not be able to address address the real real problems of our societies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, with this, I'm going to finish our session. And I, I know that we are going to announce uh, ICD uh, report, FinTech Market Entry Report, uh, which highlights Albania, Azerbaijan, Bosnia and Herzegovina and Turkey. So uh, with this, I want to thank to our distinguished speakers. I encourage you to have uh, more discussion during lunch break. Thank you very much. Big salam to everyone. Thank you. With you all today. Um, I will ask you know, to prepare a few slides as well for the keynote. So it's just to give you a brief uh, you know, background of what's IFIN why I'm moving to Istanbul. I'm actually joining the club. This club seems to be getting bigger and bigger by the day. People are moving from all around the world to Istanbul, and I'm just one of them, and a very proud one. So if we can have the control for the slides, please. Slides. Right, so what's IFEN? It's actually about you know, meeting the challenges that uh, Islamic financial institutions are meeting in general. And this is not in Turkey, this is actually everywhere in the world that we see. The first and the foremost is actually having access to high volume and high yield market segments. Islamic financial institutions are actually struggling to penetrate into many of them 
this is where the, the, you know, the value lies, the consumer segment, the SMEs, the agriculture, etc. they are almost inexistent or very, very small in Islamic financial institutions. Also, the adequacy of their products and the required infrastructure, that will mean the product structure itself, the, you know, the networks, uh, the support, etc. that will be required, you know, to make things work is just not there. The costs are very high due to complex processes and procedures that, you know, these financial institutions they use and the human resource and time consumption in order to execute those products and to fulfill those, you know, the, meet those procedures. There's a lot of paperwork as well involved as well. And because of all this, there's a lack of competitiveness. So a very general, you know, allegation on Islamic financial institutions that besides being not very good in service, they are actually more expensive. And there are reasons for that because, you know, I have listed some of those. These are the things that contribute towards, you know, these banks being more expensive. So they are not, you know, competitive between them and they are not competitive at all, most of the time with conventional because there is high cost, low volume, and restricted playing field. And then also there is this question of effective management of Sharia compliance risk uh, you know, exposure um, in the wider market activities. So the more they engage with the you know, different parties, which is an inherent result of uh, you know, doing a proper Islamic finance, that means that the Sharia non-compliance risk is also increasing, the exposure becomes you know, difficult to manage, and it has its own consequences as well. So, all these things, they actually culminate into two major problems for the stakeholders of Islamic financial industry, and they are growth and sustainability. So how do we grow these financial institutions, and how do we make them more sustainable? So this is where IFIN comes into place, into, into the picture, and as banking as a service solution, this is what we have been termed as by the Turkish regulators, Bededeka. So they have given us the status of banking as a service solution. So it's a first of its kind Sharia compliant fintech. I call it M3 digital solution. What's M3? It's multi, multi, multi. Multi suppliers of finance, that could be banks, financial institutions, leasing companies, etc multiple products. It's not about Murabha. On IFIN, you can do all sorts of Islamic products. And it's also multi other parties, including retailers or SMEs or agricultural stakeholders and so on and so forth. So this three module of multi is actually our model, which is very unique until now. What it does is that the customers of these Islamic financial institutions, they'll be able to obtain finance for their desired items, whether they are consumers or in future, when they are going to be the SMEs or other you know, uh, stakeholders, they will be able to have Islamic Sharia compliant finance instantly. So instant is actually the, you know, the key word here. How do we do that? By linking Islamic banks or Islamic financial institutions with retailers, SMEs, corporates and regulators. So all of them we bring together on the platform and we provide an enabling technology. So it's not a disruptive fintech, it's actually an enabling fintech, right? It helps the industry. We are not going to cause any harm to the existing Islamic financial institutions. We are actually going to help them a lot. We are going to help them tremendously to grow and to become sustainable and inshallah be more competitive as well. And how do we do that? By simply digitalizing their existing products and workflows. So again, they're not required to take any products from us or use our procedures. We will just digitalize everything that they're already doing. So it's, you know, the, the digital version of, of their existing activity. Now, what does it mean? Effectively, it means that within our system, we have a built-in automated credit decision engine. So the algorithms, they work, and in real time, they communicate with the bank, with the retailer, with the credit bureau, with other you know, agencies and so on. And they crunch all the data to provide uh, you know, a decision for f approval of finance within 20 seconds. So the minute the button is hit by the, you know, for, for the query, within 20 seconds you will get the answer yes or no. And if it's a question, or if it's yes, then it's just a question of 10 minutes just printing the agreements, signing, and off you go. 
You don't need to go to the bank anymore. You don't need to go any, to any branch. You can just walk into any retailer as consumer. And in future, we are working on an SME solution where you know, the, the supply chain financing and other types of SME financing shall be executed 24-7 on this platform without the need of moving anyone. So this is a cloud-based system. And we work with API integration with the, you know, the bank's core banking system. Um, every financial institution will own you know, the, the product that they have, and they will use their own workflows, their own credit policy, and their own Sharia governance. So we have got nothing to do with it. The system is made purposely for Sharia-compliant financing. It does not recognize interest or fines, so it will not be able to you know, do any conventional transaction. And also, all the structures are embedded within the system, so in accordance with IOFI, you know, Sharia standards or rulings, or the rulings of, uh, you know, the local uh, national Sharia board, for example, here in Turkey, the system will be parameterized according to that, and the system will not allow any transaction to take place or to complete if it's not in accordance with the, you know, the requirements. And then, of course, there is security protocol, and the IFI will have full control over, uh, you know, over, over the system. So this is the snapshot of our first product that we have already launched in, uh, you know, in Oman and now, you know, launching in, in Turkey very soon, inshallah. So this is uh, our consumer financing, you know, solution. And what you see here is, you know, in the middle there is IFIN, the secure platform. And on this side of, uh, you know, the screen, you see multiple financial institutions. They can be participation banks, of course, you know, in Turkey, but there may be in future, you know, other institutions and in other countries, we have leasing companies, we have finance companies, etc., etc. They're already there. Then in the middle, you see, you know, these uh, products. So this is what I call the, you know, the multi-product module. So where you can do murabha, you can do istisna, you can do ijara, you can do service ijara, and so on and so forth. And then on the other side of the platform, the third module is where you see actually different types of suppliers, which could be the car showrooms, the white and brown goods, uh, you know, suppliers, kitchen manufacturers. You can also integrate healthcare providers, uh, you know, events management, and you know, educational institution, traveling, tourism, and so on and so forth. So anything that may potentially require any financing can be actually integrated here. The only thing is that the transaction, the financing will be done in a Sharia compliant way. So this solution is, is not only just a platform. This is actually more than a, you know, a digital platform where we also provide, which is very important, you know, this is, this is an integral part of our offer that once any financial institution signs up to our system, they are not required actually to lift a finger, go anywhere in the market. We will do onboarding, IFIN will do onboarding of all the stakeholders who will be joining the platform, whether they are retailers, whether they are SMEs, whether they are corporations as anchor, uh, you know, uh, corporations, you know, for uh, supply chain finance and other parties like credit bureau and so on and so forth. So everybody will be done, you know, we will do the due diligence, we will vet them, we will, uh, you know, onboard them, they will be on the system, the banks will simply do the business. So we just free up the time, we free up the resource for the you know, financial institutions to focus on what they are good at. And we take the rest of uh, you know, the charge from them. And what is more, so this we have named as Tasir. and what is more that there are two further solutions that are uh, you know, in progress. So the first one, or the second one that's going to be, is the SME financing. This is in development, inshallah will be launched very soon, and then very innovative, this is in planning now, but not yet in development, but very soon, inshallah, we'll put that in development, will be agriculture financing as well. So again, this is going to be a groundbreaking, uh, you know, inshallah solution. How do we create value? Very simple. I mentioned two major issues, growth and sustainability. This is what we focus at. How we get there? By providing access to high volume, high value, customer segments to the financial institutions, okay? We provide them with a wider customer outreach, so they will have access to customer wherever the customer is. So the, they are not anymore waiting for the customer to walk into the branch, they don't need any branches anymore. Also wider business hours, so as far as the business is being done outside, you know, they, they are making money. And then customer acquisition, and of course customer loyalty as well. So this is how we provide growth to them. How do we make them sustainable? By creating higher capital efficiency, higher yield on their customer, because obviously 
you know, their cost is going to be significant less. The customer acquisition, the, the, the execution of the transaction, you know, all sorts of, uh, you know, their fixed cost is going to be reduced significantly. That will increase their competitiveness, not among between, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the participation banks or the financial Islamic financial institutions, but more, you know, and with conventional. So our objective is actually make Islamic financial institutions better than the conventional. This is what, you know, I think a couple of, uh, you know, panelists have already mentioned this, that we have to be better. We have to give a better model. So we are moving towards that, inshallah. And what that will mean will be there will be more profitability and there will be better risk management as well for, uh, you know, the financial institutions. That's how we help them becoming more sustainable as well. Very briefly, our structure. So there are two companies behind uh, IFIN. The founding partners is IFAS. I'm actually the group CEO of IFAS. It's uh, a pretty well-known Islamic finance professional consultancy in the industry with uh, a very, uh, you know, long track record of, alhamdulillah, 15 years uh, of being in business and, uh, you know, completing projects, uh, you know, in the more than 51 different jurisdictions. We also have Path Solutions, our technology partner, who are the largest co-banking system providers, you know, in the industry. So these two companies that are veterans of the industry, they have actually come together as the founding partners. And they own jointly IFIN that is actually based in Bahrain. So it, our head office is in Bahrain. And then we have uh, already a live operation in Oman through IFIN Oman. And the second one now coming into, inshallah, in, you know, we are already operational. So we have IFIN Digital Chozumler Onun Sherikiti here in Turkey. And we are going to be live, inshallah, hopefully in quarter two of uh, 2022 in Turkey, inshallah. And then before the end of the year, we also have uh, IFIN UAE and IFIN Saudi Arabia, inshallah, coming uh, live as well. So that's the plan. And obviously, you know, the, the, the, the expansion continues. We have already received more than 100,000 uh, US dollars in two different awards, industry awards. So Alhamdulillah, it has been recognized and it has been, uh, you know, rewarded. And uh, that's it pretty much. We are trying, we are making an effort to make Islamic finance faster, cheaper, safer and smarter for everyone. Thank you. Any questions, I'm more than happy to take. Thank you very much, Brother Farooq Raza. Wonderful presentation. Very exciting.